formal era of time. Yeah. It was just stunning. Yeah. Ah! Right. All right. Well, we are all here. So thank you for coming all. Nuri, if you would present your work to us, we would appreciate it. Great. Um, well, thank you. Before I get the slides started, I just wanted to say thank you all for being here and acknowledge all the different faces in the room who all of you have been supportive of me over the last several years. Um, we have a lot of PhD students here, Stephanie, Dan, oh, and there's Geneva and Alex walking in the back, <laughs> Geneva's from the Department of uh, Education. Um, Andrew Flynn is a medical student um, at CU in Andrews, and my wife and my father-in-law are here. And, um, also, of course, Kelly and Jane. Jane's the chair of the, um, the chair of the master's the MPA program here. And Kelly's the sis associate. associate dean. And then you know my uh, committee members, Mary and Lonnie and John. So thank you all for being here. And um, let's see, let's get this show on the road. Technology is working. <laughs> So today I'm going to, it's running a little long, but um, <clears throat> I, hope to, I hope to shorten it up a bit. So I'm going to start by talking about my motivations and the, what has inspired me to do this research um, and then talk briefly about my theory, then outline the methods and the findings, and finally talk about some of the implications. And then I'll hand it over for questions. Um, so my primary motivation is I came from Denver Public Schools. Now my kid is in Denver Public Schools. And this photograph was taken while I was at the Denver Zoo as a volunteer chaperone. So here I was engaging in public service. And I was engaging in public service with a school that is 70% children of color, uh, more than 60% um, free and reduced lunch. My kid is um, non-traditionally gendered, and his, their best friend is black. and. Here I was, a white man, trying to engage with this madness and trying to make sense of how I fit into this and how I could deal with my identity was really the inspiration for how I could improve my public service and my service uh, to academia. Um, and then last Friday, you know, we had an attack, another attack. And um, there's not much that I can do really to help but I really feel compelled to help. So I wanted to dedicate this presentation um, to the people in New Zealand who are suffering right now um, because of these issues, because um, that's what I can do. So um, that's why I'm motivated. And here's my inspiration, the literature that I rely upon, the shoulders that I'm grasping while I try to climb this uh, project. And that really lies in three major areas, public administration theory, institutional and organizational theory, and then critical oppression theory, which is how I'm grouping feminism and critical race theory. In uh, public administration theory, I rely heavily on works by critical feminist and critical race scholars, such as Foldy and Buckley, and uh, of course, Dr. Stivers. Um, I rely heavily on the representative bureaucracy literature, as presented by Barbara Cucci and Sally Selden. Um, social equity literature from Susan Gooden and George Fredrickson, and the publicness literature out of Barry Bozeman and Stephanie Wolf. Um, in institutional organizational theory, I really look heavily at the organizational theory uh, by Argerus and organizational traps. Um, and for institutional theory, I turn to W. E. B. Du Bois, whose theory of really conceptualized race as an institution. Um, and that's a lot of the inspiration here. And then Scott combines these two with institutions and organizations. Um, and then in critical oppression theory, this is how I make sense of these institutions, how I dive into <clears throat> these institutions and try to peel them apart and see how they're affecting organizations. My mentor, one of my mentors here, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Cheryl Matias, studies critical whiteness theory. Um, and uh, Judith Butler, I turn to her and one of another one of my mentors who's now passed Anne Scales, who studies critical feminist theory. Um, multiple masculinities theory, I use uh, 
Collinson and Hearn edited a book, and Raywin O'Connell, uh, actually, she wrote an article in PARGS, you know, about the only multiple masculinities in literature I've seen in the literature in public administration. And then Racism Without Racists, I think, is the seminal book for how to understand modern American whiteness and modern American race. And for intersectional theory, I really turn to bell hooks. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw is often cited for intersectional theory, but bell hooks is where I got my inspiration for how to understand how these race and gender intersect. So that's the basis. And then that led to a theory that started by conceptualizing what whiteness and masculinity actually are. So I define whiteness and masculinity as institutions that maintain white supremacy and patriarchy. There's a lot of pieces here that I need to unpack. Uh, we got masculinity and whiteness, of course, institutions, maintenance, which is power, an aspect of power and then white supremacy and patriarchy. I'm going to start at the end. So white supremacy is the empirical fact that white people are allocating greater resources and power. Right? And we see this in a lot of areas, but of course we see it in wealth. And to this day, white people have exponentially more wealth than black people and Latinos. And in fact, even though Asian Americans have more income now than they've done in previous times, they still there's a large wealth gap between whites and Asian Americans as well. Um, patriarchy then is the empirical fact that men are allocated greater resources and power. Recently, we had an election that's called, been called the Year of the Woman. You know, we have 106 seats that are occupied by women in the House of Representatives, but that's still only 24 percent. Right? So we have a long way to go, even after the Year of the Woman election, and 25 percent of the Senate. Now, these are controversial terms. And they can raise the stakes a lot of times. But I think these terms are necessary to be used because when I look at the history, I don't see a point where old white supremacy and patriarchy ended and a new system emerged to replace it. As you can see, there was this, uh, we had Brown versus Board in 1954, and there were no integrated schools in the South. Then integration started to occur. But since the 80s, we've been having another round of segregation. The same process, before we came to equality, the same process reinvested itself and strengthened itself. So we're dealing with the same structures that we had in the 60s. And so I think it's necessary to call it by its name. I also, when it comes to power, we need to understand that white men are not the problem here. That it's whiteness and masculinity that we're looking at, right? And they're not the same thing. White men are heterogeneous. There's many different types of white men from, you know, Marky Mark to the guy teaching his clan, um, his son how to be in the clan, to the transgender man who's on the left. White uh, masculinity and whiteness look like many, many different things. But institutions of whiteness and masculinity place all the, have the same pressures on white men to conform to certain norms certain rules in certain cultures. And that is power. That's how it's maintained. So institutions then are collections of rules, norms, and culture that dictate meaning for social life. When we're trying to make sense of our world, we turn to these institutions to make sense of it. Um, and uh, for example, capitalism and consumerism, right? They're institutions that really dictate our how we value things. We go about our lives. And I've, I've uh, envisioned performances, pulling from Judith Butler's work primarily, performances are these embodiments of these institutions. So for example, from consumerism, uh, consumerism can be performed as the Ma Apple store with these clean lines and everything's neat and pretty, right? Or consumerism can also be performed as the junk shop where we go into it and it's uh, there's everything everywhere. But both uh, of these shops are equally performances of consumers. They're dealing with consumers, right? So whiteness and masculinity, what I've done is I've gone through in the dissertation and highlighted 30 something performances that have been documented in the literature as being related to whiteness and masculinity, as maintaining white supremacy and patriarchy. And then I've tried to record that. And I recorded them in a setting that is surrounded by these institutions, not just whiteness and masculinity, but blackness, capitalism, consumerism, femininity, professionalism, and of course, 
and whiteness and masculinity and where they intersect at the center of this institutional framework. One last thing that I think is important to note is that institutions are holistic. So it, it makes them difficult to study because they're not just at the individual level. They're not just psychological and work processes, which is where we often focus. But they also are simultaneously operating at the organizational level, in organizational structures and cultures, and at the societal level, in discourses and law and economics. And by discourses, I'm using the um, Foucault-style term of discourse, a story that we tell ourselves to make sense of the world. So from this, this theory, I developed two research questions. The first one is my quantitative research question. What effects do whiteness and masculinity have on public employees' work life? And I developed hypotheses, six hypotheses from that. But basically they can be broken down into two causes and effects. So the cause is when whites men slash white men are overrepresented in management, and there's too many managers compared to the employees, then white men and white men employees will show more satisfaction and public service motivation. This is figuring the congruence with the racial and gender um, institutions will help them to feel more satisfaction and public service motivation. My second research question is how do public organizations, public managers, and public servants perform whiteness and masculinity? This is the qualitative question. And for that, I had to get into the holistic institutional frame. So I had to look at all three levels. At the individual level, I'm looking at processes and psychology. At the organizational level, I'm looking at structure and culture, organizational structure and organizational culture. And at the society level, I'm looking at discourses law, and economics. So here's the um, overall framework, the map that I used to try and research this topic in the federal government. In stage one, I looked at my, the quantitative data, and I did statistical analysis on that. Then that helped me identify typical cases, typical organizations and units that I could then use to go in and do qualitative interviews and really flesh out what was going on within the federal government. And the quantitative, I used federal employee viewpoint survey data, which is publicly available. Started in 2004, went up to 2000, they've released 2017 now. And um, that makes 11 years, it wasn't every year, but it was almost every year between then and now. Um, after I deleted supervisors from the data set, because I was only looking at employees as it was a cause effect between supervisors and employees, right? I had around 2 million observations in 289 different work units over each of these years. Um, my, my dependent variable was satisfaction of public service motivation. I developed uh, indices using the literature that has developed similar indices using the same data set. But I did find that there were two, factor loading revealed that there were two distinct satisfaction variables. There's job satisfaction and management satisfaction and then public service motivation. And then because of a variety of data challenges and also to make it interpretable, I uh, created a dummy. So there's one if it was above the mean in terms of satisfaction or public service motivation, and zero if it was below the mean in terms of public service motivation and satisfaction. Um, looking at the data broken down, I regret, did some comparative regressions um, using all my control variables. And we find that job satisfaction, management satisfaction, public service motivation all sort of work differently. They operate differently. So job satisfaction, you can see that men of color and white women are significantly different than white men, but women of color show about the same job satisfaction. Whereas it's more of a racial thing with satisfaction with management. White people tend to be happier with their management than people of color. And then public service motivation, men of color are the most satisfied and white men are the least satisfied, and women of color and white women are lie in the middle. So it's very complex, these interactions. So when I <clears throat> divide it into white and people of color, and men and people who aren't men, I'm really breaking down a lot of sophistication. To, a lot of the complexity is lost. But that's one of the limitations. My independent variable is whiteness and masculinity management. So I took the proportion of supervisors who are white, and then I calculated the proportion of employees who are white, and I subtracted one from the other. And that equaled my measure of whiteness in the unit year. Um, so we see that whites are overrepresented in management by about 7%, and as much as 64%. Men are overrepresented by 12%, and as much as 70%, 72%. And white men are overrepresented 
by 12% as much as 76%. And I also think that that's important to note that this is the EOA was 1972. This still this shouldn't still be a problem, right? We're 40 years on now, so this shouldn't be a problem. Um, and then I did controls for organizational size, resources, and hygiene. I tested several controls. These are the ones that actually had a large explanatory value and were the most valuable. So these are the ones I kept. I analyzed using logic fixed effects clustered on 289 units with robust standards. So then qualitatively, I turned to Dorothy Smith in institutional ethnography. And I did this because she highlights gender as a problem, not a way of understanding the world um, through the lens of uh, through basically a feminist lens. Um, and she also highlights the work that individuals do to maintain gender. So what I was really looking at was the work that these individuals were doing, the white men in my study, were doing to maintain whiteness and maintain white masculinity. <clears throat> and of course, I used the typical case of sampling, which is to say I used the statistical analysis to decide which work units I could and could not uh, interview. I did 14 interviews, seven of them were white men, five with women and five with people of color, so there were some women of color in there, um, in eight different agencies from DC, rural Virginia, and Denver, and uh, from the entry level, the lowest person was in the entry level, just started in the federal government, the highest person was the highest ranked career employee in their agency. <clears throat> so okay, what did I find? Well, first I found the qualitative, as I mentioned, the quantitative data gave me this really interesting silhouette of what was going on in the federal government. And then I really felt like the qualitative data fleshed it out, made me see who was really in there, in these offices. Um, so in terms of silhouettes, I was able to confirm four of the hypotheses, which is to say that whites, men, and white men all exhibited more public service motivation when their managers looked more like them. Whites were more satisfied when more of their managers were white, but I didn't find the same thing with masculinity or with white masculinity for, for um, satisfaction. Um, and it's funny, even though management satisfaction, um, whites were white men were more satisfied than the average, and job satisfaction are less satisfied than the average, Actually, in the end, the regressions turned out the same for management and job satisfaction. So I combined those in the hypotheses. Now, there's some limitations here that I want to mention. First of all, that I have this huge data size. So I should have found p values for everything. And there's a couple of explanations for that. One is Banaji explains that, and she's, she's the one who is responsible for implicit assessment tests that uh, has everyone talk about implicit bias, like the Starbucks training that they did after the uh, discrimination in Starbucks. So she's the one who designed that. And her paper in 2011 discusses how race and gender are always endogenous to both the ind independent variable and the dependent variable. They are always cause and effect. So if you, when you start finding something, it usually takes high numbers and usually the p-values will be low and the r squared will be low. But also, I think direction is more important. So Klein argues that direction and the uh, comparative coefficients are more important than looking at the p-values in the r-squares. So um, last, I had some problems with the multi-level modeling. That's because I was looking at an organizational level uh, supervisorial variable combined with the individual level, whether they're white or not, right? And so that's cross-level modeling. In terms of multi-level modeling, that was a problem. So that was another limitation to the quantitative data. <clears throat> My qualitative data revealed a very rich picture of masculinity and whiteness in almost every aspect of federal work. Now I'm just gonna go through each of the propositions and highlight why I think that these are supported or not. And then uh, I'll call it, I'll open it up for questions. So in the individual level proposition number one, I have strong support for the idea that public servants daily tasks include performances of whiteness and masculinity. For example, minimization is this idea that white people and men will say, look, sexism and racism is a thing of the past, or it's not that big a deal. 
You know, you should basically calm down. It's a way of sort of making sense of race without they themselves feeling like they're involved in racism. And I got that a lot, especially the history point. I think that's just history now, right? We see from my data that in fact, there are, there is still, uh, whites and men are still too often managed in managerial positions. So to say that it's history is factually inaccurate, but it's a good way to minimize it. Another way that we found minimization is by people saying, it's not history yet, but these young people, they're gonna change it. So we just have to wait for the old people to retire, right? So that's another way that I found people were minimizing. Um, I also find a lot of microaggressions and macroaggressions. For example, this man of color said that every time he spoke to one of his coworkers, he had to consider the consequences. So over the years, I've realized that a few individuals, how far I take it, by that he means talking about race, is how much they're not going to talk to me for two days. Your coworkers aren't talking to you for two days. So individual proposition number two, I find strong support for public servants uh, making sense of race and gender through whiteness and masculinity. For example, colorblindness, which is the primary articulation of race and gender in our day and age, um, is colorblindness and gender blindness or gender suppression. And one white man said simply, I should never mention race or gender. I mean, that's my operating assumption coming into this job. It's just never mentioned. Another white man told me he had never mentioned it in his entire life working for an agency that has been in the news a lot for racism. Um, and he had never mentioned it. And then when I started really talking to him, he started to realize, oh yeah, I have, I have talked about it, but in ways he didn't think about. Um, so now moving on to the organizational propositions, I find strong support for the idea that organizational structure allocates power and resources to white men. And this works in two different performances simultaneously. We have job segregation, where almost all of the professionals are white and almost all of the support staff are black. And then we have people promoting from the professional positions, we have from the places that whites are occupying. So we have, as you move up, it probably gets a little white and a little more male as you go up and up in management. Um, and that brings up an interesting question around contracting, how a lot of people that I talked with, and we don't have a lot of data on contracting. In fact, Paul, uh, I believe it was Paul Light said that we don't have any really good picture of contractors at all. But um, a lot of people said their contractors were how they brought in diversity into the organization. But contractors can't be promoted. So contractors are always going to be ground level, always going to be street level. Right? Organizational pro proposition number two, I had strong support for whiteness and masculinity being implemented as processes inside the organization. So this operated in two ways. Keeping in mind job segregation, we had ad hocracy and entrepreneurialism. So white respondents often answered me saying things like this, just be as creative as you want, do whatever you want to just build it. They could do anything. There is more entrepreneurialism in the federal government than I realized. I was shocked at how many, how many people were improvising on the go. But then when I talked to people of color, the answer looked very different, especially women of color. They talked a lot about bureaucracy. We tend to take a hierarchy of military org chart perspective per se. I like the way he used that bureaucratic language to communicate how he felt he was trapped in this bureaucracy. And it's interesting because a lot of the people, uh, these are the same parts of these sub organizations where the adhocracy is going to be these people who are managing people who are in these rigid bureaucracies. In, uh, in my organizational proposition number three, I have strong support for whiteness and masculinity in organizational cultures. Um, one person just said it, one white woman just said, I think my office is shaped by white and masculine culture. So it affects everything. Um, also dress. Hey, you're wearing that shirt. I had one uh, person of color, a man of color, who was um, wore a traditional shirt from his or, or country of origin, and he negotiated this shirt, wearing this shirt for months. He said, it's not very different. You couldn't even tell. If you walked in the office, you wouldn't even be able to tell that I was wearing it. But for some reason, he felt compelled to walk into that office and negotiate how and when he would wear this shirt. And then he eventually showed up with it. And uh, his, his manager actually seemed to respond very well with humor and uh, made him comfortable. And now he says he, he feels like he can wear it anytime. But he did over, have to overcome that hurdle. Um, 
And organizational prop proposition number three, I had moderate support for women and people of color engaging more fully in units with less whiteness and masculinity. And I say moderate support because I had a lot of indication that women were frustrated and they would leave work units because they were feeling frustrated on the job with masculinity, essentially, when they encountered masculinity. But people of color would note frustrations, but they wouldn't leave. And there was a sense amongst the people of color I spoke to that they were not, that they didn't know where they'd go. That essentially, there was more consistent whiteness across the government, and that maybe there's more variability in masculinity. When it came to the society level propositions, I wasn't able to record a lot about it. And this is the challenge with holistic institutions, is to record all three levels at once is, is difficult. I think I'd have to go back and actually do second round of interviews to record a lot of data. One place where I did really get a lot of data was on legally mandated blindness. So the effect of the Equal Employment Opportunity Act and how it has made people very nervous to talk about race or gender at all. Like the uh, witness who is frightened to, into doubting his own handwriting, these people were frightened into doubting their own race and gender identity, and whether or not they could bring that into work, which led them to becoming colorblind and uh, gender blind and race and gender neutral. For example, one person said to me, we are very careful about things that have to do with employee relations, you know, EEO stuff. And this was in response to me saying, do you ever talk about race or gender at work? Well, the law immediately was the first thing that popped into their head. <clears throat> Which is interesting because those laws cut both ways. They definitely help us to implement good strategic plans, but they also at the same time increase nervousness. Um, so Jane Adams, 1902, we were just talking about her. She said, it is well to remind ourselves from time to time that ethics is but another word for righteousness that for which many men and women of every generation have hungered and thirsted, and without which life becomes meaningless. Looking at the literature on race and gender in public administration, I feel like people are hungering and thirsting for social equity. And they don't know where to find it or where to get it. And that's really what I hope to bring with my research, is that ability to solve that hunger and thirst. Um, in public organizations, I feel like we can better manage masculinity and whiteness. One, by cultivating camaraderie, um, because a lot of people talked about how at the conference, at a dinner at a conference, or at a baseball game, this is actually a basketball game because I had to get Michelle and Barack in there somehow, <laughs> but at a baseball game, this is the only places they ever talked about race or gender, literally ever, that they ever remembered talking about race or gender in the workplace. Was at conferences or baseball games or softball picnic or whatever. So these sort of moments were able to undermine that nervousness and break down color and gender blindness in a way that made them feel a lot more aware of their coworkers, what their coworkers were going through. In the modern era, we're going to telework. So I think we need to start thinking about cultivating similar communities using uh, applications like WhatsApp. Um, we can also engage in race and gender development of white men. And that means running into each other. It means making mistakes, a lot of mistakes. And it means being okay with that, accepting that we are the ones making a mistake and trying to move forward from that. Um, and it also means at some point we have to look at other sources for structural change, right? These ad hocracies, these bureaucracies are all recreating whiteness and masculinity. So we're gonna to have to look to things like indigenous leadership and feminist management techniques like Mary Parker Follett to think about how we can redesign these organizations to undermine whiteness or manage the whiteness and masculinity that's in there right now. Theoretically, what we can do is really stain the slide. Think about whiteness and masculinity, make it apparent, become aware of it, just as a biologist has to stain the slide to see the cells of, a micro, of an organism. And we, we're doing that in public administration in a variety of ways. So in institutional theory, we can start thinking about not just the action arena, right, and all the institutions, that, are, that how that's uh, within an institutional context, but start breaking down the institutions that are in that action arena and figuring out how whiteness and capitalism and 
uh, blackness and masculinity are all interacting in these areas and really make sense of these institutions. In public and nonprofit management, we can think about not managing diversity, but managing whiteness, but managing white masculinity. Uh, in representative bureaucracy, perhaps there's no such thing as passive representation. Perhaps it's active representation of whiteness and masculinity. Um, in organizational theory, we can think about alternative ways of organizing our, our, um, our public organizations so that we can manage whiteness and masculinity better. Human relations theories and practices, we can start thinking about camaraderie as an important way of managing diversity or managing whiteness and masculinity. And in social equity, we can figure out how to better engage as people who look like me really engage in this project that we're undergoing, this way that we're hungering and thirsting for social equity. Yeah. I'd like to say last a big thank you to all the committee members and to my family and my friends and colleagues and mentors and everyone else who is here and has helped me through this journey. And with that, my questions. I have a couple questions for you, Nuri, and then I'll turn to Cam for questions. Then we'll come to John, then we'll come to Lonnie, and then we'll open it up for questions from everyone else. So first of all, it, when I listen to you talk about masculinity and whiteness, I think about this international comparative work I'm doing, and, and it seems uh, I want your response to this. It looks like the takeaway from doing international comparative work is that culture explains everything. Hmm and culture explains nothing. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to whiteness and masculinity, I wonder if it explains everything and nothing. Yeah, I mean, the way I think of it, I did a presentation last week at ASPA on methods, quantitative methods mm -hmm. of whiteness and masculinity. And the way I think of it is it's really shallow. And I think that's because after the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and then the EOA in 1972, the box that whiteness and masculinity had to fed in got much more shallow. But it also filled out to, to affect more aspects of life, right? So it's shallow, but it affects everything. And so, yeah, it, it, ex it doesn't explain anything fully or even mostly. It explains a few things fully and most, but. Um, most things it explains just a small r squared you know just that small little piece of what's going on but it's so pervasive that it has a huge impact let me turn your attention to just thinking about methods mm -hmm. so you have engaged in a project here which has approached the subject of whiteness and masculinity from the macro level systemic from the meso level, the organizational, and from the micro level, the individual. And you said it's complicated and it's very difficult to, to tease out specific learnings from this. Yeah. If you were to do this project again, would you design it the same? Would you design it differently? I think this project as a piece of a larger project, uh, which is to say exploring all these different levels in a more individually and focused way is, is valuable. And as a dissertation, I, I might have designed it a little, I might have designed it, I definitely would have designed it a little differently, but um, I think that the project is worthwhile to try and look at all three levels in when you have this long format where words, word count doesn't matter. I think this is the place where we have to try these big and, and uh, ambitious sort of projects. That being said, I think most of the value that's come out of this is realizing individual and organizational level performances, things that I intend to explore further as my research goes on. Does that answer your question? What, thinking about everything you learned in this, what do you know now that you didn't know when you started? Um, so there were some surprises, like the, how telework was affecting um, how telework was affecting camaraderie. I also feel like there's some way that whiteness and masculinity has evolved in a way that hasn't been recorded much in the literature, in the in the theoretical literature. Um, for example, nerd masculinity 
is uh, this really new way of expressing both whiteness and masculinity simultaneously. Um, and it's pretty pervasive. Um, I have a much better understanding, just from me personally, I have a much better understanding of how it works in a global sense, how whiteness and masculinity work in this global sense surrounding the organization. And I, I don't think I would have gotten that without attempting this sort of thing. Yeah. Cam, let me come to you. What questions do you have for Nuri or what comments? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I really enjoyed being a part of this project, a small part. Um, oh, there's so much I could say, so I'm trying to struggle here with what's the, uh, what's the most important thing I want to say. I, I, I think it, I, I want to know more about um, how you see yourself um developing as a scholar from this point and then i'll i'll have a follow-up to that i mean i mean intellectually yeah what kind of a researcher do you perceive yourself to be at going forward i i've thought a lot about that um as i can as i consider what my next sort of moves are going to be and um one thing that I felt like I didn't do well here was I was sort of too easy on my my um, informants. Not I, not that I wanted to be unkind, but I left them thinking after I interviewed them. I left them thinking they're all good guys. You know, all these white men—they're all good people—and I didn't find anything. And then when I started diving into the data, you know, from the comfort of my desktop and transcribing all this data, I started to realize all the ways in which they were enacting whiteness and masculinity um, unconsciously I mean, in ways that they didn't, I am sure they themselves didn't even intend or realize. And I think one thing that I want to do is become a lot more sensitive to that um, as a researcher. I want to be able to identify that more quickly. And um, I also want to be able to critique it more thoroughly. So I think moving toward that critical perspective that is um, personified by yourself and by Dr. Matias, by Dr. Cheryl Matias, um, in the way that you can see how these things are connected. So I really want to look at, I really want to continue with those connections. And to that end, I also am exploring my methodologies. And I, I really feel like I have a lot to get, learn in terms of how I will be researching and looking at the empirical world, how I'll be looking at real life and social life and making sense of it. Okay. That, that's, that's what I wanted to hear, actually. Because I think oh. <laughs> I, I, Mary is real surprised at that. Um, <laughs> I, I think... Um, you're somewhat hampered by the paradigm that you're working in right now. I mean, you're essentially working in a sort of semi-positivistic paradigm, and which entails a kind of separation between you and the world and a kind of separation in the way you view people in the world and, and, and the relationship between them and the world they're in. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that you might, it might be interesting for you to explore um, another way of doing this research, which is less about separating yourself from the field that you're studying and the people from the field that they're in, uh, i.e. reality. Yeah. And, and enable yourself to come at it from, uh, a different paradigm that that will begin to reveal to you the the dynamics of the social construction that's going on that is the source of things like whiteness and masculinity and I think that um, 
going farther with Dorothy Smith, I think is not a bad idea at all, because I think she uh, sees the world as, you know, her idea of institution um, is a kind of socially constructed idea. Yeah. Um, and, and, and her focus on texts as the link between individuals and institutions is not something that I think, you know, has to, is the be all and end all of this form of research. But I think given your interests, um, the text, meaning both the written texts and also the interactions that go on between people um, in organizations that take on patterns which then become structural forces that act back on um, the, dyna the dynamics uh, of the interactions of the people who created them. Hmm. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I just, that would be my hope that you would, as you decide what to do next research-wise, that you would spend a little time being self reflective about the paradigm that you occupy at this point and whether it's the most productive for the kind of critical work that you want to do. Yeah, I feel I feel pushed I feel pushed by my interests and by my curiosity toward um, deeper, more critical work, right? And I feel pulled by this desire to communicate to a wider audience. Um, and I don't know where I'm gonna land in that, really. I'm sort of looking at those two forces and trying to figure out where I'm gonna land. Yeah, but I definitely wanna do more uh, institutional ethnography. There's a lot more there, I think. Yeah. There really is. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't think Dorothy Smith is a friend of quantitative empiricism, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you might find yourself up against having to make some uh, choices about who you are as a researcher. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, that's still a big question mark for me. So yeah, yeah, I'm definitely, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And one thing I would add to that because these are excellent points that Cam is making, is that you don't have to just fall off one cliff and be there forever. You can have multiple streams yeah. in your research. And as you pursue them over time, you sort of learn just where you are yeah. and you learn which one is the most revealing for you. And you find yourself, you'll look in a rear view mirror one day and know where you are. <sighs> Yeah, and I think I think what Cam is rightfully pointing out is that I'm having troubles switching between epistemologies. Yes. Yeah. 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 I can't. I, I'm having problems switching from brain to brain. It's very yeah. difficult. And I'd like to try yeah. try to work on that yeah. more. Yeah. If I could say that one of the things that bothers me about the field today is that when people feel they're being really open-minded, they talk about mixed methods. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's a sign of real open-mindedness. No, 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 because the paradigm does not get mixed, and yeah. methods get mixed, but the paradigm doesn't. And and so, and I don't think you can mix paradigms, because mm -hmm. I each each way of knowing starts from a set of assumptions which are both epistemological and moral in terms of what various kinds of knowledge enable you to see and study. Uh, these are the kinds of questions I think you would benefit tremendously from because you're so smart and this, is, <laughs> and this is a fine piece of research and you have such fantastic commitments in my opinion that um, I think um, you, know, it, you might find all kinds of vistas that, that you can only sort of dimly sense at this point and I went through exactly that transition so I feel like I can talk about it. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's very touch. John, touch. Well I think a good segue to that would be that I think Dr. Cybers has some really good points. Not pushing back but I would I would um, 
distinguish, I don't even know if I would call it an alternative, where I agree is that I think it's very easy and possible to be a mixed methods researcher despite not every piece of research being a mixed methods piece, right? Um, I consider myself one. When I do things that are dealing in Indian country, that is all qualitative. Those people do not want to be data points. I can tell you that right now. So not mixing that paradigm as she mentioned is very important. But I think in another aspect, when I research innovation in public and nonprofit organizations, there are data out there where certain data points can be identified, finessed, and, and utilized, but I would never mix the two, right? So I think that point is well taken. You've produced something that is um, thought-provoking and provocative, and I have a handful of questions for you that um, I'm really curious about. So in, in distilling the ideas of whiteness and masculinity, when you got to your first proposition, you sort of answered one of the questions I had but I want you to clarify a little bit more in terms of um, whiteness and masculinity has identifiers, right? I mean, there, there are, are individuals where you can determine, okay, there is whiteness and masculinity here. But I'm also hearing nuanced nods to, to behaviors that sort of are emblematic of whiteness and masculinity. So a question, and I hope it's not too much in left field, is in theory, is it possible for these dimensions of whiteness and masculinity to occur at the hands of someone who is neither white, identifiably, nor biologically masculine? Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you're maintaining white supremacy and patriarchy, then you're enacting whiteness and masculinity. Right? Even if you don't have small w whiteness, uh, which is skin, you know, phenotype, or small w masculinity, small m masculinity, which is also a phenotype, mm -hmm. but um, but it will never be as authentic. Right? It's never going to be as complete as, um, and that's the point. Mm -hmm. The point is to make sure that there's always when somebody else tries to enact whiteness and masculinity, the point is to exclude them. Right? It's a property value. Mm -hmm. that we can exclude that person and say, no, 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 you know, we're, we're the ones who are really white. Mm -hmm. We're the ones who are really mad. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and highlight, the, the whiteness and masculinity has this way of highlighting how the disconnect and the tension between um, when someone else inhabits it or, or embodies it mm -hmm. in a performance, does performance. But yeah, the performance has certainly enabled that, but never fully, because white skin is always going to be part of the performance. Sure. And the reason I ask that is because I think there are, you know, I think your your dissertation alluded to it in pieces, that there are institutional or organizational contexts that lend themselves to behaviors that tease that whiteness and masculinity out further. You know, if you were to put organizations on a spectrum of how rigid they are, let's say a branch of the US military, versus one of the federal organizations where you may have interviewed somebody where it's much more fluid and entrepreneurial, so to say, mm -hmm. right? So I think there are conditions where um, structures might enhance or diminish this a little bit more. And I think that actually provides you an opportunity with further research in this area. Um, for the sake of time, let me proceed further. Um, more of a tactile question. Can you expand a little bit on, on what your question was on contracting? Yeah. You, you brought up contracting and you seemed a little um, stymied by, by um, clarify that for me. I, I don't so, think to it as much. When this contracting theme started coming out of the my qualitative data, I noticed that every time a contractor was mentioned, whether it be someone who's doing data entry or answering the phones or janitorial services, right? Anytime they mentioned a contractor, it was they, they said, and there's there's a lot of names of people of color, right? Mm -hmm. In that, and there's a lot of women doing that. So I noticed, and one person blatantly said it. He said um, something along the lines of, "If we want to bring diversity into an organization, we hire a contractor." Huh. And so that got me, yeah. <laughs> okay. And that got me think, looking deep, di diving deep into the literature, looking for data on what 
who who are these contractors? Who are government contractors? And it turns out there's no. I mean, Paul Light says we don't have the data. They're just not there. So we have no idea who these contractors are. That's we why guess. we have contractors, <laughs> so that there is no accountability on that. That's why it exists. And, and that's why I was going to say, I mean, work by folks like Savas and Sklar, Johnston, Romzek, all these people who've looked at it in a much more tactile sense on the public management side. Yeah. They're not talking about the racial dimension that you include. No, no nor gender. There is also a gender dimension. There's a lot of the people who are paralegals in a lot of these legal agencies, mm -hmm. they're being pulled in, they're, they're women of color especially in DC. There's a lot of women of color. And they're they're telling us, or, or my, my informants were telling me that they're not qualified. They don't have a paralegal's paralegal license. They haven't taken the right classes to be a paralegal, but they're here, they're well-meaning, and the government will only pay for a contract. So I've got to hire whoever comes to me. So okay. you know. let's go to your point that you made about the EEOA back in 1972, and you, like many people, are probably wondering, well, you asked, you said, why is it still this way? Yeah, well. Wow. I go to even further, further past that. Mm -hmm. And because we're in a, a scholarly realm here, um, the fact of the matter is, is our field has been predominantly white. It's been predominantly male. Yeah. We have scholars who still to this day love to put forward our founding fathers, and I have my rationale for putting them in quotes, as the preeminent founders of American public administration. I, I personally, as an intersectional cisgendered male, have a lot of issues with that. Then in 2019, that's how we're, what we're still talking, you know. Um, and, and there are certain scholars that, that I, I'm curious about. You know, white slave owning men in the 1700s are still framing our debates on public administration. And you're shocked about the EEOA <laughs> 1972, hopefully opening that up. I am too, because that should have been a huge beacon, a huge shift, a huge shock to the system. If it was a time series model, we should see the implementation of that and we should see that curve shift dramatically, right? Mm -hmm. But you're saying we have it. Well, I mean, there's been some shift, but it's certainly not like the reason why I mentioned that is because everyone I talked to said, look, we just have to wait for these people to retire. You know, wait for the old white men to retire and then everything will be okay. But at the same time, these same people were mentioning, and then we brought in all these women and people of color in the 1980s. So all these people were brought in at the entry level in the 1980s, women and people of color in this affirmative action plan that was inspired by the EOA. And um, yet we're still seeing white men are in charge. Right? So there's, there's a, there's this permanence, to quote Derek Bell, there's this permanence to race, this permanence to gender and the hierarchy that that implies that um, isn't, isn't going to be easily undone, if at all. So, so are you saying we have not re reached our tipping point then? I don't know that there is a tipping point to reach. I, I, maybe I'm a little cynical, but I think whiteness and masculinity is are so... They evolve so quickly. Mm -hmm. They they fill the space that we give them, and there will always be space because we can't legislate everything, right? So it's gonna, I, in, it's not gonna happen in my lifetime. <laughs> I feel like so. So I guess part of the reason that I, I was curious about that is because again, going back to our constitution, which is the um, longest enduring surviving constitution document of its kind in the world right now, it has been changed very little. And yet, you pointed out the fact that we have more women in Congress than we've ever seen, probably more women and more uh, non-white uh, bureaucratic administrators than we've ever seen. Um, why do we still, like, I don't think the Founding Fathers truly expected someone like AOC, let's just say, <laughs> right? Like, on the surface, in premise. Right, because if, 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 if all of us have this notion of equality, even though at the time it was just lip service and now we're actually seeing it come to fruition. But I guess my hope is, is how are you gonna use this work to further propagate the need to dismantle patriarchy, to dismantle white supremacy? Mm -hmm. Because we've seen in theory and in practice that this is not something that we can be wholly 
objective on. Mm. So I guess kind of transitioning to my last question, what 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 what's the future of this? I, I uh, feel a lot of tension as a white man occupying a space that has traditionally been occupied by women and women of color. And so many of my mentors were, are incredible women and women of color and people of color. And I, uh, I feel that, brings, that makes me feel a lot of obligation. So I don't know entirely where it's going, but I feel like I can use my voice as I can. And um, I feel a very strong obligation to continue trying to do so. I guess, and that's all I can really well, say at this point. For one, yeah. you should be complimented because if you haven't already, you know that people are going to cock an eye at you and think, "Why is this white guy talking to me about whiteness and masculinity?" Right? Yeah. But I think it's fantastic that you are, and I think it's exceptionally praiseworthy that you are. My last question to you is: When you talk about these things, I've often seen, and there's literature that alludes to it. Some of it you put on the, on the board about allyship mm. and how we have basically a spectrum where on one end you have the folks who are big head nodders like yes yes we've had it wrong what can we do to help i'm ready to make a change right you can say anything you want to and they're going to be there to the opposite end then gets a little bit fatigued like i thought we were making progress what more do i have to do right how do you mitigate that in this context is there something, I mean, and, and you just said you don't know if no. you're going to see something like this happen in your lifetime. But, yeah. But for the people who may feel, I'll just say it, guilt, it's like, well, I'm white and masculine, I'm sorry for, for being impressive, but I'm ready to change my ways, I'm ready to help out, I'm ready to be a good ally. So one, one of the things I try and do whenever I speak on race and gender is talk about my own racism and my own sexism and how I participate to try and make people feel more open to that idea mm -hmm. that they are also par participating in racism and sexism. The other thing I'm doing is trying to figure out what sort of methods I can use that people are going to listen to a little bit more. And I don't know how successful that's being, but that's that's sort of where where this originated, you know. Um, and I think I have a lot, of, lot to learn on that front. Yeah. And I, I'm still learning it. Well, I think um, that alone is going to speak volumes to people, honestly. Just a simple check of privilege. I mean, what you've done here is, is, um, you know, with all the the, the canon of representative bureaucracy and, and, and social equity. I mean, this this is something, in my opinion, that does have a unique traction to it. And I'm, I'm really proud of you for taking this on, if I can say that, because some people just wouldn't feel comfortable, regardless of their identity, regardless of what sphere they came from. And I wish you all the best in carrying this forward as you know a big plank of your research. Thanks. Um, I'm going I'm to say just say one more thing to go back on, and that is that I find it really necessary when um, this is a conversation we had earlier. But I find it really necessary when we're talking about um, strategies that women and people of color are using to achieve equality, right? To uh, that I, I I find it necessary to give them their strategies. Whatever strategies they need to survive in this world, it's I think that they should be able to take that. And that's why I want to focus on whiteness and masculinity instead of the sort of strategies that we're trying to do. So, sure, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm going to kind of unintentionally build on John. I think that you had mentioned at one point that you felt like you could push your interviewees a little bit more. Hmm. And one thing I was kind of curious about with the interviews was there were hints of people recognizing their privilege and the fact that there were inequities and that they had advantages. Did you talk much with them about that or did they really sort of say much about that and how, kind of, I guess, coming to terms with the reality that they immersed in? It seems like they tell themselves all kinds of myths about how I'm colorblind and, yeah. you know, I, I'm just doing my job and all those other sorts of things you talked about. Did you try to get that, get them to sort of um, come to grips with their unique privileged position at all in your interview process and what was their response to that? <sighs> I mean some people That's I pushed funny. some people I pushed harder than others. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'll say mostly their their response was surprise. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know if they were surprised that it was coming from me mm -hmm. or if they were surprised that the idea that they were that these ways in which they were participating uh, had never occurred to them. But they were surprised. And I think they were 
Um, I think I managed to get most of them pretty comfortable, except one. She was not comfortable. Mm -hmm. But most of the people I managed to get pretty comfortable, and I, they did, um, almost all of them gave sort of this head nod, in this sort of neo-progressive way, gave sort of this head nod to my privilege. And then went on to try and talk themselves out of being uh, of being culpable for participation, mm -hmm. right? So in, in that way, this is really recording a new group of people in these federal workers who are all highly educated. They're all um, being paid fairly well for the most part, and um, so we haven't had a lot of literature on them. And they're really expressing that mainstream democratic progressive point of view. Almost all of them were Democrats. Um, and it, it really is interesting how they're willing to sort of nod at it, but not really confront it. And they wanted, they, to a person, they said they wanted to know more about what they could do. <laughs> well, except the one woman. <laughs> so I think given that, I think one of the things that kind of is interesting to me is how do you, how do you sort of, make change without, because um, I think about this a lot in the context of policing, how do you make change without offending people's sensibilities or their realities, right, while still getting them to acknowledge, hey, I'm a white police officer policing minority neighborhoods, right, and police will tell you, oh, well, I am, um, you know, like, I'm colorblind, I don't see color, but realistically, right, they do, and they work within these neighborhoods, and so I guess I'm just kind of curious, how would you use your knowledge from your dissertation and your interviews of, and the way that people propagate this reality that exists, that we, we all kind of play a part in sustaining um, in some way, how would you combat those sorts of institutional rules and things, or what types of policies or changes or actions would you recommend? And then you recommended some at the end. Yeah, yeah. From the individual level, I'd say they, um, discomfort is necessary. There's never going to be a time where they're going to be like, eh. I'm racist. You know, it, 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 it's a hard process to be like, oh my gosh, my whole life I've been participating in a system. And as a cop, right, that that's, they're being accused of that all the time and the, the perspective is no, we're not, we're no, we're not. So to come to that realization is going to be painful. And it's one of the, but it's, I don't think it's as painful as the experience that women and people of color are uh, facing racism and sexism. And I, I also think that once you are willing to acknowledge that pain, you feel more full, more more complete. So at an individual level, that's what I, that's what I would say. Um, the, the society level, like what policy changes, fortunately we're pretty hampered by the readings of the Constitution by the Supreme Court that say that we cannot, that that is not a compelling state interest to undo historical discrimination. So there's just nothing that laws can do here really, because any way that we become color cognizant, any way that we try and undo this historical discrimination is going to be shot down by the Supreme Court. But we can do this at policy level, and that is we can try and create structures, organizational structures, and organizational cultures that are more welcoming. Instead of going to the baseball game, we can go to a women's basketball game, or WNBA. Instead of going to, or instead of um, uh, designing it with this very centralized hierarchy around a single person. One of the problems is that lawyering agencies have no management training whatsoever, so they don't know what they're doing. But um, <laughs> I know from experience, my wife is a lawyer so, in an agency. Um, but uh, but so a lot of people just don't know what management strategy they're using, and so they're just doing default bureaucracy. And we can go in there and give them some alternatives that have been tested and used in real settings um, the, in feminist settings, in some of the feminist conquests, and of course, indigenous settings around the world use them every day. And so these can create different power differentials and power structures that, that could help to undo this. Yeah. Great, yeah, and I think this is an excellent, excellent dissertation, one of the best I've read in a long time, so Thanks. good job. Thanks. <laughs> Questions from anybody else? Our comments. Yes, Alex. Yes. Um, so, uh, sort of trying to process a question that was on my mind based on what Dr. Rocky said. Um, so, racism, masculinity, I think of these as moral questions. Hmm. And we're trying to 
look at how these impact public administration. And that end of the pendulum, I think, is scientific. Mm. Because they are sort of, in a way, undermining the kind of progress that we want to make as people, as humanity, as human beings. So, what do you think are some of the constraints in trying to deal with a moral problem from purely scientific, detached? Mm -hmm. And um, to what extent could that impact where you go with this very impressive organization? Nice. Um, yeah, so there's no, I don't think there's any way to investigate race and gender from an objective scientific, you know, perspective. And I, I actually, looking at the literature, so, so early, um, early econometrics, right, you talk about statistics and how statistics were developed. They were developed proving eugenics. They were proving the eugenic theory that white people were superior to black people. So from the very beginning, they themselves were superior. Correlation coefficient actually was used, first tested, proving that white people were superior to black people. Right? The normal curve, the, the, the Pareto curve that we all know, that was also tested, proving that white people were superior to black people. And then ordinarily squares proved the way that it was tested was that it proved that we shouldn't be helping people in black communities, because if we put up a poorhouse in a certain area, more people around that area will be poor. Now, never mind the fact that poor people come to poor houses, right? But uh, ordinarily squares itself. And it's because every model is subjective. Everything's subjective. There's no way to be objective. The only thing we can do is put our subjectivity on the table and say, here it is. Now critique it along with my work. Right? And this, this move toward third person objectivity is denying us a very crucial piece of what it means to do good science. Um, so that would be my response to that. Um, and uh, that's gonna, but then that goes back to what Cam was saying and my pragmatic decision to use quantitative methods as well as qualitative methods. And that is to say, people don't wanna hear that. <laughs> right? So you have to say it. Someone was mentioning the other day, oh, Maria. Nagawa. Remember Maria Nagawa from last year, anyone? Anyway? So Maria Nagawa said, was saying the other day that in one of her classes someone presented on whiteness. And he ha kept having to say that this is a fact. And I I find I do the same thing in my slides. There's an empirical fact that white men are have more power <laughs> resources, right? Um, but that's what we have to do. We have to show them every step along the way that our bias is a fact. It's we, we know we've recorded it. We can see it. And then we have to try and Place it on the table and counteract it. Whether it's a moral question is a different question. And it is, there's also an empirical question. Right? There's the moral question about whether or not we should be doing whiteness and masculinity. And the question that I've tried to attack in this dissertation is whether or not whiteness and masculinity is there, which should be self-evident, <laughs> right? Because all of our founding farmer framers and everyone else. But um, but to be able to identify what it looks like. Now we can start to, for those public servants who want to undo it, I'm not that, right? I'm just trying to give them tools so that they can dismantle it. Good response. Seven? Oh, sorry. I, you can go ahead. So I, I'm curious, because we, I sort of can intuit the, in, the individual approach to whiteness and masculinity, and we talked about how like legally or from these big narrative perspectives, whiteness is mandated by the Supreme Court's colorblindness sort of approach to it. But what what do from the bureaucratic organizational level, like what are the what are the systems operating there? When you say that we're operating organizationally from a white perspective, like what does that actually look like in what you are seeing? Well that's that's the job segregation and then power shifting. So we segregate people into their different offices. And then we put white people on top of or men, white, white people and men. And actually, the data show that there's more men now than white people. So it's sort of confusing. I mean, it's still there's still a lot to be buying. But um, so yeah, that's where that's coming from. And to undo that, I suggest going to alternative forms of management within individual offices and within agencies as a whole. 
So we have the technology now that we can be doing a much more open and democratic system of management among bureaucrats. And as we have made bureaucrats more representative, we're still not there yet, and we might be going backwards, but as we've made them more representative in the last 30 years, to go to a de more democratic system would actually make it a more democratic model of implementation. Um, but we need social equity before we can hit democracy, not the other way around, right? If we don't have poor people and people of color and, and women at the table, it's never really a democracy. So in bureaucracy, we have more of that than we do in the represent in the elected branches of government. So we can start to bring some of that perspective if we can get to a flatter structure in those agencies. Whether or not that's going to happen with political appointees, well, that's a different topic. But I think we can get there. Stephanie, you had a hand up. Yes. Um, I just start kind of reflecting on um, the theme for PatNet for this year, which I think you'll be there, and talking about um, kind of this era of post-truth. Hmm. So I'm just curious, kind of with what you were talking about was Alex's question. Um, how would you situate that in this in this context of post-truth, in the sense like, what do you say to the folks that don't care how much you preface this and saying these are empirical facts? The folks that just will kind of reject it by default. Like, what do you say to those people? And taking into consideration the amount of power that they have and they can leverage. My research does not approach those people very well. Um, I'm sort of aiming at well-meaning white progressives and well-meaning men. That's sort of who I'm aiming at. There are other people who speak better to them. And I think, I think the best way to speak to those people who are in that post-truth reality um, is really point out how these things are hurting them. Because most of these white power structures and masculine power structures are meant to align you with people whose interests are not aligned. If you align with whiteness, then you're willing to take, you know, huge tax cuts for the wealthy because you're aligned with whiteness, right? Or uh, even if you're very, very poor and you need the money from those taxes, right? So I, I try to, one of the things I said to, actually just last week to someone who was, I think, not quite post-truth, but definitely reflecting it, was um, I told him about the work of Ricky Lee Allen, who talks about how, uh, the discrimination against poor white folk is actually racism. It's actually saying you're not the white kind of right kind of white person. And furthermore, the reason that racism still exists is you, right? And that immediately validates their world experience. So if I can validate their world experience, that's that's the best way I can get to them, I guess. But I'm not that's I'm not the guy for that. <laughs> Yeah, um, part of my research is looking at cultural theory and, and embeddedness and generational. And that's teeny tiny one corner of it all. But one of the things I've been playing with recently is looking at the generational mix in Congress, our elected representatives, versus in the executive branch. And there's while the mm -hmm. numbers are similar, generational is different that there are younger more younger generations in Congress than there are in the executive branch. Interesting. And that the number is growing and that the executive branch is in fact getting older and older as members of this so-called silent and boomer generations don't retire. Mm -hmm. So your, your statement of people saying, well, we're just going to wait them out, they're going to retire, <laughs> it isn't necessarily playing out in that way. Yeah. And coming back to whiteness and masculinity, I, I see it more as a cultural conversation, a reinforcement discussion. And how do you how, how do you reconcile that or do you reconcile? Um, so in terms of reconciling? Reconciling the idea, because you made a statement of we're 40 years in and we should have jumped this. Shark. Shark, right. Shark, right. Yeah. <laughs> but if, if waiting them out isn't the right answer, right. what is or is there? So one of the tenets of critical race theory is that racism is permanent, right? And that's not necessarily a, a tenant that is necessarily, I can't comment on the truth of it because it's an assumption from which I work. Um, if I am proved wrong in that, 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but in the meantime, uh, that's sort of the assumption that I'm going with. And I think, I think what we're seeing is that every generation we have a new way of expressing racism and sexism, and we don't recognize it at first, but that's what's going on. Um, and I, I think I see that in between the people, most of the people I have are fairly young. And I think that I'm seeing that in my data as well, that it's just shifting to nerd masculinity, for example, um, instead of burly masculinity, you know? Um, and to telework instead of these offices where the white men get the corner offices and people, women of color, are working in cubicles. It's now telework where nobody's talking to each other at all and maintaining this nervousness that's using good and toxic. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I'm playing with all these thoughts, so it helps. Okay. Yeah, so the question is how, how do you keep culture from regenerating itself exactly. when we know that it is regenerative? <laughs> Hoping to find it. <laughs> Any other questions? Then I ask all the guests and Murray to step outside or leave. Lee, do you have a chance? Do you want to? Have time to talk to me later on after this? Yeah. So my office is unlocked. Just go have a seat yeah. there. I, I, I told my boss I wasn't coming back. Okay, we're just going to have a seat.